Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Don't Breathe 2, released in 2021. This is the sequel to 2016's Don't Breathe, which was made by the guys who did the Evil Dead remake, director-slash-co-writer Fede Alvarez and co-writer Roto Saegas. They returned to co-write the sequel, with Saegas taking over as director, but their efforts fall short for me this time through, especially compared to the original. The first Don't Breathe was a tense, dark movie with a simple setup and an awesome exit execution. Its characters were morally ambiguous, with the blind man, who's initially a home invasion victim, turning out to be a reprehensible monster. I loved it, and was hopeful when the sequel was announced, as long as they didn't treat the blind man as a full-on protagonist. I said as much when I covered the first film. But I'm expecting it to be a twisted situation, and not one where they actually expect us to root for the guy. <laughs> Don't Breathe 2 doesn't just ask you to have sympathy for its devil, it pretty much forgets that the dude's a devil at all. Anyone who skipped the first movie would have no idea that the blind man once kidnapped a woman, locked her in his basement, and artificially inseminated her with a turkey baster. Between the much less interesting characters and the perfunctory rehashing of the first movie's best parts, this is definitely a contender for sequel the world most didn't need. That being said, I guess it has kills to count, so let's get to them. The movie begins like the original, with a drone shot of Detroit. Makes me homesick. Too bad just like with the original, only a few exteriors were shot on location. The rest were faked in Europe, this time Serbia instead of Hungary. Thanks again for nothing, Rick Snyder! A house is shown to be up in flames, with a little girl survivor crawling away from the inferno. She passes out as we fade into a time jump! Nah, that's not the same. The now slightly less little girl is in the woods, sporting a Nancy Thompson white hair streak. Oh shit, and there's a Rottweiler? That's a bad omen. This Ramsey hunt, ends not with a bang, but with a terrified whimper. Turns out it was a training exercise conducted by the blind man. Sorry, father. I'll make it next time. She is, of course, referring to her bed. The blind man and obviously not his daughter live in obviously not Detroit. His new old home is even more isolated than his city block bachelor pad in the first one. The story he's told this girl is that he's her dad and that her mom died in the house fire we saw. He rescued her and also named her Phoenix for thematic relevance. Speaking of names, some behind the scenes stuff confirms the blind man's name. His name is Norman Nordstrom. I feel like I should have known his name is Norm. Everybody knows that name. Phoenix is homeschooled via braille and revolvers, but it leaves her isolated with not a single pal to speak of. She's left fantasizing about doing jackass stunts with friends. I'm Phoenix Blindman, and this is Scooter Spin. <laughs> The closest thing Phoenix has to a friend is their, uh, plant delivery woman? Hernandez is a fellow war vet who helps out the blind man, but doesn't know about his past. During a trip into town, Hernandez takes Phoenix to visit her mom's resting place in their old burnt-out home. Not exactly first on every kid's road trip wish list. I mean, it's no Cedar Point. In a public restroom, a creepy guy creepily appears. Wow, you're pretty. Shut that shit down, Shadow! You snap my fingers and he'll bite your testicles off. Yeah, Fluffy here will listen to any order of this phoenix. It's good that she has protection, like Shadow the dog and Hernandez the vet. The creepster Raylan sees Hernandez and knows she'll be a problem for future kidnapping attempts. That's why later that night, he and his men <laughs> and dog boys set up a roadblock trap. The ruse works, and with no pachucos to protect her, they're able to solve their Hernandez problem. And when the only tool you have is a hammer, well, every head seems like a nail. At home, things are tense between Phoenix and Noclops. She's sick of being lonely. You have no idea what it is to be alone. You have me. You're not enough. Damn, put away them talons, Phoenix. You're cutting deep. Phoenix is played with strength and confidence by Madeline Grace in her theatrical debut. Wish my first job had had a good boy co-worker. As long as I had a piece of a raw hot dog in my hand, he would do whatever I wanted. Hey, that's how Zorin works too. The blind man is played by a returning Stephen Lang, who, lest you forget, goes by slang. The first time I met Stephen, I said, hello, sir, nice to meet you. You said, it's not sir, it's slang. For as much as the movie fumbles dealing with his character, I gotta give slang credit for his portrayal of a dude completely beaten down by an uncaring universe. He spends his life waiting for the axe to fall. Of course, the character's response is to kidnap girls to give him new daughters. So fuck that guy, no matter how upset he is at mean old God. Never take anything for granted. God will take it from you. 
That night, their house is beset by home invaders, who lure the blind man out through his cute Roddy shadow. Unlike the criminals in the last movie, these ones aren't interesting characters, or really, characters at all. And definitely no match for the girl who grew up in slasher military school. In an echo of the most memorable shot from the original, co-writer turned first-time director Roto Siegis charts Phoenix's course around this new batch of invaders in an unbroken five-minute shot that took 25 takes to time perfectly. There's a very complex choreography between the lighting and the camera, going through hallways, going up the stairs, going into a room underneath the bed. The shot begins with the blind man getting ready and going outside, then moves all around the house and goes upstairs to show Phoenix reacting to the new problem. Some of her escapes are admittedly a bit unlikely, but it's a stylish way to show off her survival skills. That Phoenix is clever as a fox. Still, how light can that damn girl land on her feet? Does she have stealth armor equipped or something? She could take down the whole damn Yiga clan. Another benefit of this unbroken shot that, yes, is still going, is that it shows off the movie's detailed set design. This house was a very important character of its own. It's the kind of the mother that's missing from the family. Outside, the blind man finds man's best friend's body. Poor Shadow. He had been a loyal, scary good boy since the last movie. Norm checks Spike for chest bursters, but only finds ammunition, which is weird. He hasn't fed Shadow kibbles and bullets in years. That means someone popped this pup, so Norm's about to go full on John Wick. Right as Phoenix is found by a bird catcher, the party crasher punches through the window to play chiropractor with the guy. At Pop's command, Phoenix runs for the basement, but gets absolutely wrecked on the way down. Oh my god. Don't worry, y'all. She's fine. Just a little blood. Oh, and hyperventilation. Okay, and now she's passing out in a chokey. I guess she could be better. The blind man's all of a sudden in the garage, sealing a stab wound with crazy glue. A guy named Jared starts sniffing around, looking like junkie Cody Rhodes, but the old man bests him in both hide and seek and grab and snatch. Jared is found screaming through a pair of super glued lips by his brother Jim Bob, who kind of looks like an evil elf. With his nose glued shut too, that boy can't breathe. So maybe find something to cut his lips open with, or nope, just stab him through the cheek. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you sound like Donald Duck? <laughs> they realize they're dealing with a Navy SEAL as Jared cuts his mouth open like Billy Butcherson. Cody does love to blade. The blind man's in the basement hefting some rebar like his personal Excalibur when he hears that his plumbing is getting used. Cause Phoenix just woke up to find herself in an impromptu Houdini act thanks to this guy Duke. Norm rolls out a Hank Hill special to make sure Duke can't get trigger happy on him. Then he steps out and uses his ears in anger to get started in a Duke dispute. Their ensuing scuffle includes some bushes baked beatings and what has to be a couple of compound fractures. When Duke walks away the victor, the blind man MacGyvers a bomb out of some wires, a cot, and the leaking propane. It blows up, killing Duke, who at least died doing what he loves, terrorizing children and the elderly. Norm saves his surrogate daughter from the cold water casket, sending her tumbling out like Indiana Jones from a fridge. Breathe. <laughs> <laughs> Breathe. <laughs> Breathe. <laughs> That's not what the movie title told me to do. Raylan and his men start to beat down the door as Phoenix gets a look at Duke's flame broiled face. Huh, kid, kinda makes you see the guy who built you a custom child jail in a whole new light. Before she can think too hard on it, Raylan corners them in the Home Depot Garden Center. It's not me you need to be scared of but the man standing next to you. When this line was included in the trailers, it made me think the blind man would still be treated like the bad guy that he is. But that was not the case. No, I don't know who he is. Because Raylan doesn't even know Norm's past. Come on, man, if you're hired to be in the sequel, at least do your research. The movie did a similar fake out earlier with Hernandez. You're a bad man. A man who's done terrible things. Made you think we'd crack this nut before being like, nah, just playing. At least I know you think that just like sometimes I do about myself. War changes us all. No soul returns wholly from it. Again, I love moral ambiguity in my movies, but the sequel falls too much on the side of the blind man's not that bad compared to these other guys. Raylan does know that the blind man is not na not 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 her real dad. He is. Check it out. He's got a sprig of rogue white hair just like she does. Turns out Raylan caused that house fire eight years ago when he messed up cooking meth. He's been locked up ever since. The blind man must have found Phoenix that day and kept her for himself as a replacement daughter for the one he lost long ago. Now that Raylan's free, he can rescue her from 
from the sky. As he explains without taking a single breath. But he did steal you away from me and now he must die, you understand? Norm fights back and runs away, so another hide and seek game starts as Jared wrangles the kid back to the truck. They're halfway past the begonias when she pins his foot to the floor with a pitchfork. Then the stepdad steps up and aerates Jared's shoulder with a cultivator. He takes a shovel and beats Jared's head into a disgusting peroxide paste. Phoenix screams for him to stop, but yeah, definitely too late there. Raylan finds Jared's body and decides to work smarter, not harder. He uses a bloody jacket to give his pit bull the scent of a blind man. Hoo-ha! Good boy races inside and snarls at Norm like they were in a G.I. Joe PSA. The blind man retreats to the attic while Phoenix runs into another room. There's a dog in the attic chase scene, and at one point, blind man has the chance to kill the pup, but doesn't. I mean, sure, he'll rape a woman with a syringe of his semen and hold her captive as an incubator, but at least he won't shoot a dog, right? Makes you really root for the guy. Phoenix makes another escape attempt that shows off more of her moxie, but she doesn't get far before being snatched up by Raylan's right-hand man, Raul. She's put in Raylan's truck as the blind man figures out a way to ethically escape the dog and go re-kidnap his not-daughter. Slang saw the blind man's unlikely kindness to dogs as a sort of kinship. He's like that dog that has been knocked around so much that you'd be a fool to try to pet it. Raylan celebrates his family reunion by cracking open a cooler of cocktails. Molotov, that is. He's gonna burn this bitch down. Raul points out that his dog is still inside, but Raylan says fuck the pup, pointing him do evil on this franchise's shaky moral compass. The blind dog lover rescues the pit bull and tumbles out a window before Julianne mooring his way to safety. And yet another callback to the much better first film. Phoenix is taken to an abandoned hotel in the city where she wakes up in a room with a piano box Bar and a fish tank score. Her new dad, Raylan, welcomes her to the dollhouse and says she's free to come and go as she pleases. She only wants to stay long enough to learn her birthday and her real name. Tara. That's your real name. I'ma still call her Phoenix, though. She's ready to hit the road, Jack, no matter how many famous doctors hang around this place. That guy is famous, right? I swear I saw him on the TV one time. Before Phoenix Joaquin's out the door, she stopped by the sound of a song her mother taught her when she was young. I burn. I burn. Mom? Well, it ain't Paul McCartney. Looks like the blind man lied about Phoenix's mom being dead, though by the sight of that blood she's coughing out, maybe he won't be a liar for long. New mom Josephine explains how the fire that ravaged their house also ravaged her heart. Like, biologically, since it was a meth lab fire. Her heart's just about done so, and she needs a transplant ASAP. Well, not just any heart. Doctors said it has to be a... Uh, it must be a... Compatible donor. There it is, the halo is gone. This is how these people are shown to be a worse option for Phoenix than the serial killer rapist who kidnapped her for eight years. Raylan only rescued his daughter from the blind man so he could cut out her heart and save his wife slash meth cook. For as much as this movie seems pointless to me, I don't fault any of the main cast. Session 9 scaredy cat Brendan Sexton III plays Raylan with an oozy sleeves, while Gretel and Hansel actor Fiona O'Shaughnessy gives an unsettling mania to her performance, especially when she thanks her drugged up daughter for the heart she's about to steal. Like the first film's unapologetic thieves, they're another example of Alvarez and Sayegas populating their world with amoral outcasts. It makes for a very interesting and unpredictable story when no one is a good guy. The blind man wakes up and uses his Kenchi senses and new best friend to find out where to deliver his next ass beating. Go home. Better get there soon, dude. Phoenix is about to go under the blade. And according to criminal organ doctor Thomas Hanneman, the odds of surviving this procedure are a big fat goose egg. But Phoenix can't be dead just yet. She has to be alive and awake during the surgery. I have to cut it out of her while she's still breathing. Oh, um... Yo, that's fucked up. Right as Raul is complaining about how fucked up it is, the surgery is stopped by a power outage. Raylan sends Jim Bob to investigate. I can't believe his name is Jim Bob. How fucking dumb. In the basement, Jim Bob fiddles with the breakers until the blind man senses his cue. Like he did for the original film, Stephen Lang prepared by studying with the Northeast Association for the Blind. This time he focused on navigating in unfamiliar environments. He can really see the difference in these final fights. Norm goes down with a bullet in his side, but he manages to break his attacker's arm and stop a sleigh bell down his throat. How festive. Triangulating the jingle jangle, he hurls Jim Bob's hammer directly into his skull from across the room. Once again, he murders someone by pulverizing their head, only this time it's with a hammer off screen. Raylan tells the surgeon they're going to relocate and directs Raul to gather the boys and kill the blind man. How many of us? Eight. 
of you! Sheesh, okay, I was just asking. Raul takes three guys downstairs, where they find the blind man lying on the ground in some water. But Raul knows this might be a trap. Maybe since he's been dealing on these streets since the first movie, where we saw him fencing stolen goods for the ill-fated thieves. He lets the three nameless criminals wade in first. As soon as the T-Rex ripples touch the blind man's hand, he sits up and fills them full of holes. So long, fellas. We hardly knew you. Well, actually, we didn't really know you at all. Still invisible on dry land, Raul decides that he'd like to come back for a third movie if they ever make one. They're gonna kill her. And that's not cool with me. <laughs> what a line. Raul tells Norm where they're taking his pretend daughter, and I guess absolves himself of any sin. On their way out, the surgeon decides he's done with this shit. His cowardice retreat is cut short by the blind man off screen, who reduces him to lasagna noises in the dark. <laughs> Oh yeah, not even a trip to St. Mungo's is gonna sort that out. Some cans of pesticide go off, but they must not be very strong, since nobody has any trouble breathing for the entirety of the next sequence. Seeing through it is another story though, and the blind man takes this opportunity to make his attack. The sequence is a colorful version of Norm taking away his opponent's ability to see, but it's not quite as evocative as the first film's grayscale night vision scene that worked so well. Raylan fires his gun blind, but instead of hitting Norm, he puts a hole in Josephine, Proving this Nina doesn't live forever. The dads square up for round two as Josephine's body lurches and rolls. With Phoenix handcuffed to the corpse, the wheelchair drags her towards an empty swimming pool. And this pool's deep enough for regulation diving. To keep herself from going over the edge, Phoenix grabs a nearby machete and hacks off her mom's arm at the wrist. Holy shit. Really gnarly stuff here. Too bad it doesn't work. And Phoenix winds up splashing down with her mom anyway. Thanks to some interference by Raylan's dog emancipating itself, Norm is able to grab his foe by the face. Now, you are gonna see what I see. Is that metaphorical or... Nope. Oh, holy shit. He's going full Pandora. Just squishing those eyes for Jujubees. Raylan's gonna need some Ray-Bans after that. With everyone apparently dead, it seems like the perfect time for Norm to make a confession to this girl he kidnapped eight years ago. I am no father. Okay, Mr. Man, but is that all? I have killed. Movie's ending soon. Anything else you want to add? I have raped. There it is, some last minute character growth from a guy who once declared Not a rapist. Norm revels in the shame and self-pity and tells Phoenix to leave him to die alone. She does, and that's when Raylan comes back, badder and blinder than ever. He tees up the blind man for a throat slit, but is stopped by a Freddy vs. Jason machete through the sternum. Phoenix has returned, and she's picked favorites among her fathers. This homeless horse is put down and tumbles into the pool to die right next to his already dead wife. Aw, that's nice. Phoenix tells the blind man to hang on because she can save him, but he says that's not necessary. You already have. With that, he gives up the good fight and apparently dies. There is a mid credit shot of his body, but it never shows any definitive signs of life. Since I have doubts about another sequel getting made, I'm calling it here. The blind man is dead. With her mother, father, and fake father all having died within about 10 minutes, Phoenix immediately walks to the nearest kid's shelter. The movie sunsets with this little darling asking Phoenix her name. What's it gonna be? Rachel Gray Skywalker? Something new to start afresh? Or maybe- My name is Phoenix. Or just go with the kidnapper's name. Okay, how many one-note criminals got blindsided in this unnecessary sequel? Let's find out and get to the number. Hey, it's Zoran! Oh, shit. James! I'm here to talk to you about doing another kill count, huh? Where are you hiding, in here? Ah, it's the prop closet. You doing your live streams? You love doing live streams. As much as you love playing Sea of Thieves. <laughs> Not here, but, oh man, is this one of the, oh, this is for the Chucky recounts. Oh, I want this, please. I will take this. I could take this from your house right now. No, no, I'm a good employee. Where are you, man? I just want to talk about doing more kill counts. You in the bathroom? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Don't know why I opened the bathroom without knocking first, but uh, what do you think about doing Starship Troopers? Right? That's not really fully horror, but there's horrific stuff. I know people want me to do, um, Critters, They Talk Season 2, but do that's no, a lot no. of- oh. No! No more Zorn kill counts! Until I need you. I'm sorry. I love you! But I put on pants.
Eleven people died in Don't Breathe 2, with the victims consisting of nine men and two women. That's a mostly blue pie chart that actually matches the breakdown we just saw recently in Would You Rather, along with a few other older episodes. It's also nearly four times the victims in Don't Breathe 1. With a runtime of 98 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 8.17 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Jared. I can't show it in the public version of this video, but his face gets fucked up. The all machete for lamest kill will go to Phoenix's mom, Joseph. A single shot to the stomach put her down. Oh, and probably breathing in all that meth lab fire smoke. And that's it. Don't Breathe 2 came out in 2021, and though the filmmakers have discussed a third film, again, I have my doubts. Until next time, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. On the next Kill Count. At St. Mariana's Home for Girls, we have all kinds of orphans to choose from. Playful orphans, artistic orphans, even orphans made of snow. Snow orphan? Snorphan. <laughs> and we take pride in pairing our little miracles with the perfect family. I'm going to take the love that we felt for Jessica and I want to give it to somebody who really needs it. Well then, our newest addition might be perfect for you. My name is Esther. Esther has a unique fashion sense. Don't you think it's pretty? An adorable horribly untraceable accent. It's perfect. And is great at teaching kids life lessons. Put it out of its misery. Sure, she has a bit of a mysterious past. The family that brought her to America died in a house fire. Thank God. But no need to have any of those awkward sex talks with her. When grown-ups love each other very, very much. I know, they fuck. Just remember, whatever you do, don't touch her ribbons. You've been warned. This week, find out what's really wrong with Esther by watching Orphan. That's a wonderful idea. And seriously, watch it for yourself without spoilers. You won't regret it. I have a special surprise for you, Mommy. Then on Friday, tune in for The Kill Count, only on Dead Meat. I think there could be something wrong with Esther. What? Orphan can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Dead Meat always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before it's Kill Count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill Counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. Guess what I forgot to wear again? Wow! Boy, I'm just the drizzling shits. <laughs> I really just gotta start adding it to my teleprompter. Wear your fucking wedding ring, James. Anyone who's watching this and didn't watch Dracula or Blackula, maybe go educate yourself, you know? Maybe go watch an episode on an older movie that you might not be familiar with, because it's pretty cool to watch them. Pretty cool to learn those things. I want to thank some patrons like Tyler Moore, Kyle, Justin Nunez, Jay Harrison, Alex, Maddie V, Harley Foley, and Laura Garman. Also, thank you Zorin for hopping in for that To The Numbers and James Chats for filming it. He's so good on the camera. Thanks, everybody. Be good people.